What we want to do now is take a look at how the gains from trade appear in this model. It's going to be very similar to how the gains from trade appeared in the Ricardian model. Of course, now we're dealing with a curved production possibilities frontier. The challenge in this model is that we've got some people who are made better off and some people who are made worse off. In the Ricardian model, when there's just one input, everybody's made better off. In the Ricardian model, there's no reason to ever oppose trade. The farmer and the rancher are both made better off because it's just labor that is the input. Here we've got a more complicated, more realistic model where there's differences in terms of the distribution of income that happens once trade is opened up. The challenge is really that we can't just add up all of the gains that go to the gainers and then compare that to the losses that the losers incur because you probably already know that, that economists are not in favor of interpersonal comparisons of utility or of well-being. It's not as simple as just putting a dollar number on it and then comparing the gains and the losses across people. We don't like to make those interpersonal comparisons. So we can't just do something that simple. What we can do, though, is we could think conceptually about whether or not the gainers could compensate the losers and still be better off. So we could think about whether or not there is a potential gain overall, whether the size of the economic pie gets bigger. So let's take a look at the production possibilities frontier and then the budget constraint and <clears throat> just visually see what the gains from trade look like first. So we've got our production possibilities frontier. Let's suppose that um, we start at point A. Let's suppose this country is not going to be trading with anybody and we start here in autarky, no trade, with uh, production and consumption taking place at point A. I'm not going to draw the ISO value line there, but you know that the relative price of cloth would have to be equal to the slope of that production possibilities frontier right there at point A. And then let's suppose that trade gets opened up and let's suppose it drives the relative price of cloth in this economy up. So the relative price of cloth goes up. We end up now at a point of tangency between our budget constraint and our production possibilities curve right there at point B. A higher relative price of cloth. Remember that the slope of this is the price of cloth divided by the price of food. So the relative price of cloth has risen. So now after trade is opened up, the economy is producing at point B. And point A was our original production and consumption point. Remember that this budget constraint tells us that the economy can consume at any point on this budget constraint. So what we see is that this opens up, if I draw a line vertically from A and horizontally from A, this opens up a range of production possibilities where consumers would have strictly more food and more cloth than they did at point A. And this allows us to see that if consumers consumed at any point on that budget constraint between those kind of curved portions there, any part of that segment of the budget constraint, they have to be strictly better off than if they consume today because they've got more of everything. So this gives us a nice convenient graphical way of showing that the economic pie is definitely going to be bigger. That doesn't mean they have to consume at that point, but it allows us to make the uh, conclusion that there are gains from trade. Um, so let's just say that the result of this is that trade is potentially beneficial. Trade is potentially beneficial. This does not change the fact that some people gain and some people lose from trade in this particular situation. It simply allows us to say that there is a situation where the gainers could compensate the losers. That compensation may never take place, 
but it could theoretically. Um, let's talk about now why governments may sometimes encourage trade or discourage trade, or we already have seen why some groups of people might be in favor of free trade and some might. Um, if everybody in the economy was identical, then of course there's going to be gains from trade because trade would be trivial, that uh, we wouldn't have anybody arguing about anything. Let's talk about the clear case where people are not identical. Um, it's common that that governments will create restrictions on trade for certain goods. And, and we'll talk more about that in a later chapter. We'll devote a lot of time talking about that. But for now, we can start to see that it may be the case that some people in the economy argue against free trade and that the government may actually um, go ahead and restrict trade because people are making an argument about that. If we think about how economists feel about trade, economists typically, usually, are, are very in favor of free trade. So let's just talk about um, why free trade is good for now. We'll talk more later, but why free trade is good from an economist's perspective. So let's just think about a, a couple of things right now. Um, that, an ar that an economist would argue for in favor of free trade. So the first thing is that when we open up trade here, it has distribution of income impacts. Some people are hurt, some people are helped, but it's not just free trade that does that. There are lots and lots of things that have distributional, distributional impacts in an economy. So free trade, let's just say, Free trade is not the only thing that affects the distribution of income. Not the only thing that affects income distribution. So let's think about some others. You would have talked about several of them in, in previous economics classes. So anytime consumer demand changes, if consumer demand changes, then, then some sectors are going to have higher demand and some sectors are going to have lower demand and it's going to change prices in those sectors. It's going to change the amount of labor demanded in each of those sectors. So any change in consumer preferences, aside from international trade, that has distributional impacts. Some people gain, some people lose. If some new technology is developed, that, that causes some sectors to vanish. So the, the creation of computers changed every economy drastically. Some sectors completely disappeared and others opened up, and that has distributional impacts. So to oppose free trade simply because it has distributional impacts on, on income, we would need to oppose nearly everything if we're going to try to fight changes in the distribution of income. What we need to do is try to figure out not how to stop free trade, but how to help, potentially help the people who are hurt. So rather than fighting free trade, it's much better to allow free trade, let the economic pie get bigger, and then figure out what to do about the people who are impacted negatively by that free trade. Um, so let's just say that we, we need a safety net because some people are going to be hurt by trade and some people are going to be gaining by trade. Here's another thing that economists would argue in favor of free trade, another reason. The, the gainers from free trade are typically better organized than the losers. So the gainers are better organized than the losers. Here's what that means. If we think about the gainers from tr free trade, what we'll talk about a little bit later on this semester is that those who gain from tr free trade, it's actually typically a small group of people. And because it's a small group of people, each person in that small group tends to gain a lot. 
The losers from free trade, a lot of times it tends to be a much bigger group. And so those losses are spread out over a larger group and the losses that each individual person might experience tends to be relatively smaller. The losers typically are less well organized. And so the gainers from free trade a lot of times make, make a much more effective argument towards the government as to why we should have free trade. This applies to other things. We'll talk about restrictions of free trade. And oftentimes those who gain from restricting free trade it's a smaller group, better organized, and so sometimes they're more effective at arguing against free trade. So this can work both ways. But this gives you kind of a, in a nutshell, a, 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 a way of understanding why economists tend to argue for free trade. But again, we'll come back to more of that uh, in the future. So that's the, the end of this specific factors model we'll kind of develop some of these ideas in uh, future chapters and future discussions that we have, but this gives you a good idea of why trade oftentimes is, is uh, supported by some groups and then opposed by other groups. So um, we'll talk more about some other models of trade in uh, future, future videos.